Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Downs. Welcome to this presentation. I'll just begin by giving you the sound of a train going by, uh, because of course, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to present using slides, so I will share the screen. And But before I'll do that, you can also obtain the slides from this link that I'm placing in the chat. As I do the presentation, um, it's kind of hard to, you know, have conversation, especially with a large group. Well, <laughs> it's not that large at the moment. Many more people registered than showed up. Uh, I guess that's the norm for online conferences. Um, so um, given that, please feel free either to uh, post questions or comments in the chat. I will be watching it um, as we proceed as well, because um, we only have, well, 17 people now. Um, if you want to jump in and talk, um, please feel free to jump in and talk. I know it's hard when somebody's presenting full steam ahead, um, but uh, I do want you to feel free to do that. We're up to 19 now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the um, here we go. And I'm looking for my presentation to share the screen. Where did it go? Now it's gone. Oh, there it is. All right, so here we go. And uh, I need to remember to face the camera. So I'll just move the chat over here so that I can see it a bit better. And I am screen sharing, whoops. All right. So where I want to begin is with a question. And the question that I have for for us today is how open is open learning? When we access an open learning environment, um, say uh, Moodle or MOOCs or whatever, Future Learn, this is what we're usually presented with, a sign-in screen. And to me, this represents right away a barrier to people accessing online learning resources. And, you know, I mean, it's usernames to remember, passwords to remember, uh, information to give, all of that. And it bothers me. <laughs> and so this presentation is a reflection on what I think about that and what I'm doing about that. And it kind of breaks naturally into those two parts. What do they want? Well, they want a little bit of everything. I looked at a whole bunch of registration forms, both from traditional institutions and from MOOC providers, open online courses, etc. And it seems like gathering registration information is just universal among education providers. It's universal indeed, almost among all publishers or presenters of learning content. Um, there are very few places where they don't want this information. What do they want? They want your name, first name, last name, middle name in this case. Uh, this is an example from the Canadian College International Student Registration Form. They want your address, the city, province, postal code, country, your phone number, your email. Here they even want your passport number and nationality. They want your gender, date of birth, first language, where you heard about it, your photo. Now, not everybody wants all of this information. Um, but not everybody wants only this information. I, I've seen requests for just about everything you can think of. Why do they want it? 
Well, we know the answer to this, right? Uh, for evidence, for admissions, to provide billing information, yes, even for open online learning, uh, for course communication, for marketing, which is a very common purpose of open online learning and upselling, so they can sell you extra things like credentials or whatever. Identity verification, if they're doing proctoring or, or online assignments. Certification, it says credentialism, I meant credentials. Uh, like, uh, well, degrees, certificates, badges, whatever, uh, for and for their own reporting and their own statistics. And my question that I asked myself is, in open online learning, do we need any of this? And for me, the answer is mostly, no, we don't. Now, I know there are other barriers to accessing online learning. Funding, need for teacher classroom materials, the barriers facing the disabled, the barriers facing uh, people based on gender, conflict, war, distance, technology, even hunger and nutrition. Um, and this is another one. And no, it's not the most important one, um, but this is the one that I can do something about from where I sit here in my home office. I will point out that the requirement for all of this information makes many of these worse. Uh, you know, take someone who's a refugee and homeless, for example, how are they going to put in their address information? Um, Take, for example, somebody who's disabled being required to provide all of this information. Uh, take somebody who's at risk where even studying is against the law. Providing this information exposes them to more risk. Uh, take somebody who just wants to casually learn something on the fly the requirement to provide all of this minimally inserts a five minute barrier before they access it. I know it doesn't seem serious, but to me it is serious. And even more to the point, because during this conference and other conferences like this, there's been a lot of discussion of open educational practices and the role that we play as educators providing open learning. The, when the first thing you see when you're signing up for a course is a demand for registration information, it sends to me a very clear message to the student. It says, we, the provider, are in charge. It says, your access is conditional and subject to our needs and interests. It also says, we are watching you. This is the beginning of a surveillance kind of environment. And very often, not always, but very often, it sends a clear message, you will be monetized. One way or another, you will be monetized. We'll use you for marketing, We'll use you in our application process for federal funding. We will use you as a potential future fee paying student at our institution. One way or another, we will monetize this. And to me, that sends the wrong message. Uh, it, it turns learning into something that's transactional and turns the student into a commodity. Some people argue that open access is all about licensing. Um, and that institutions might choose a less open license, a non-commercial license specifically, to prevent potential competitors from reusing their content. But I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I, I think that most providers don't want to be doing a commercial transaction when they're offering open learning or open educational resources. That I think is why the majority 
the significant majority of licenses used by educators and authors stipulates a non-commercial condition. And I think personally that requiring and monetizing uh, students goes against the wishes of the people who are attaching non-commercial labels to their content or courses. We could argue about this, but that's for a different forum. I think we still need to design for open, regardless of licensing. Um, I don't think that licensing gets us off the hook. It's about democratizing knowledge. It's about creating socially inclusive instructional design, including accessibility, inclusive language, uh, activeness. It's about increasing social inclusion and providing opportunities for people to be not just consumers or receivers of a service, but actual participate, participants in the creation of their own knowledge. This comes from Eden. Ironically, um, the, uh, the article was open, but it was published in a PDF that was protected such that I could not copy the text from the PDF. And so I had to provide a screenshot here. Bad eating, bad. I want to go beyond the provider consumer mod model. Um, an example of go going beyond this is the open syllabus. Um, and it invites students, course leaders, whomever to provide domain specific examples of course syllabi, uh, thus making it clear what, what the courses are teaching, what references they use, et cetera. Now, it's not so much the content of the syllabi that interests me here, but rather the mechanism that's being employed to create this capacity in the community. You have a way for people to contribute to the knowledge base, and you have an easy way via the Open Syllabus Explorer, and I checked and there's no login required for that, um, to just go in and explore these syllabi. And you can see the results of this, the graph kind of representation of all of this knowledge that just publishing this information, just posting or allowing people to contribute this information provides. And I think that's a pretty good model generally. This is also about working toward open and everyday practice. You know, things like and educating students about the benefits of openness, allowing them to contribute through open educational practices, supporting and empowering students as public scholars. So it's this attitude that we take right off the bat, instead of treating them like clients who must subscribe to our service, we're treating them as uh, colleagues or collaborators in a wider social endeavor. And that is the model of education that I think more typifies what we ought to be thinking about when we're thinking about open learning. Now, you're free to disagree with this assessment, but I think we have a point of discussion here, right? I think we have a point where we need to bring out the arguments and the evidence for or against one way of thinking about open learning. And I think that this model, rather than a provider consumer model, is probably a better, more open model. Argument could be made. We only have 40 minutes and it's a lifetime kind of argument. We look at the trends that are happening in learning. Um, and, and this is one that I saw in an article. Um, 
learning anytime, personalized learning, choices of how to learn, project-based learning less so, but uh, data interpretations, different ways of assessing student ownership of the curriculum. Uh, you know, some of these are still pretty prescriptive. When you're saying, you know, you should take project-based learning, you should do hands-on learning, that's pretty prescriptive. Giving or allowing the option, or I don't even like the word allowing, maybe how about enabling or supporting the option for project-based or hands-on learning are more in line with an open learning approach. But certainly things like learning anytime, everywhere, anywhere, things like student ownership of curriculum, et cetera. These are things that we support with open learning and that begins with removing the registration requirement. Another example, the same sort of thing, learning circles, free facilitated study groups for people who wanna learn. Now this is from P2P University, who while they have learning circles, you'll notice down there in the lower left-hand corner on the slide, they have, yes, <laughs> registration. Why do we need that? Even things like looking at assessments and statistics, and of course, that's one of the big reasons for requiring registration. But suppose we didn't look at grades and test scores. Suppose we didn't look at attendance and graduation rates. Suppose we looked at what people actually did, where they did it instead. Uh, you know, the requirement of registration and tracking commits us almost to, and, and is part of the commitment to things like grades, test scores, attendance, et cetera. So, I tweeted the other day, and I don't have the slide of that tweet, unfortunately, but I tweeted the other day that uh, I have worked with my online courses to remove all possibility of tracking things like grades, test scores, attendance, etc. Every way that I could think of to block my ability to know who's in the course, I've done that. Oh, I meant to put in a slide and it's not there. So I'll just say this now. What has the result of that been? Um, first of all, uh, kind of an existential crisis in the sense that now it feels like nobody's taking the course, um, which I know isn't true. Um, I'm sure people are taking the course. It's just I have no sign of them. Um, secondly, a problem with reporting because I work for a research agency. And anytime I tell them I'm offering a course, the first question they ask is, oh, great. How many people took it? And I have to answer them, I don't know, uh, which makes them wonder whether they should continue funding me at all. But they trust me by now, so they're not it's not such a big problem. And you know, that's kind of the nice kind of relationship you wanna have with your employer. The big thing I think is lacking a mechanism to actually improve the course, but it's not like people have no way of contacting me. I've, I've made some avenues available and we'll talk about those. So, but you know, I, should I assume that silence means everything's okay, I guess, this way I have to. So these are some costs to me of doing this, but I don't think that these costs are onerous. And I think it's better that I bear these costs than imposing the requirements of registration, subscription, tracking, et cetera, on students. Alex Ankerly is saying in the uh, comments, learning happens without being tracked by others, allowing learners to track their own. Exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, Mark Wilson saying, registration is for the allocation of resources. Some of us are self-funded and do not need to be tracked. Again, exactly. So this is my imperative. 
open learning, I say, should enable enrollment without the requirement that information be provided, hence enabling legitimate peripheral participation with the, enti with the option of greater engagement entirely at the discretion of the learner. That's what the web used to be like. In a sense, that's what the world used to be like. And, you know, I'm not trying to say, well, you know, let's all, all go back to, you know, burning wood and, and cooking over open fires. But I still think that this is a value that maybe we should be getting back to. And I think that within the open, open learning community, we should certainly be asking the question, why are we having people enrolling in these courses, registering, applying? So this is the second part of the talk. My MOOCs and, and currently my ongoing MOOC called Ethics, Analytics and the Duty of Care is an ongoing experiment in open where I am deliberately trying to resist every possibility of tracking and knowledge collection and commodification of the participants. So this is the home page for the course. Note, although I provide a mechanism to allow people to sign up for email notifications, this is completely optional. And I am disappointed to say, although there's a lot that could be said about this, I use MailChimp for my notifications. You might think, oh, that's terrible. Yeah, it is terrible. Um, but email has been, if, if I may say, wrecked by both the spammers, uh, but even more significantly by the anti-spammers, such that if you're using email notifications, if you don't go through one of these providers, you're flagged as a spammer, uh, which is a problem. But anyhow, it's, it's there, it's optional, but I also immediately after provide an alternative, uh, RSS, which is a syndication format. People can use what are called feed readers in order to access this. They can either use a web-based feed reader. They'll have to sign up with the web-based feed reader provider where they'll be monetized, or they can use a feed reader that they just download and install on their desktop. Either way, they can access the entire contents of the course from this feed, ethics.mooc.ca slash feed. And so they can keep up with the course without requiring email. And I consider that a win. I've also shared the process of setting up this MOOC. Um, so I, I issue a public apology for the number of hours of video I've produced. But there is a playlist that I've created called Making a MOOC. That's the link to it there in the slide. Um, and I talk about all of these issues that I'm covering over the next few slides in much more detail. Uh, these are stream of consciousness um, videos. I'm reco actually recording them as I'm building these courses and I'm going through the decisions that I've made and why I've made all of these decisions uh, about how to create open access. For example, I have one slide where I talk about setting up Zoom. I go through, well, first of all, why I had to create my own Zoom account in order to access the admin uh, options. And then I go through every option in the Zoom setup, explaining why I chose this option rather than that option. So there's much more. Um, Quite RSS is a free RSS reader to install locally. Yeah, and I have that on my desktop and it works like a charm. I love it. And you know, I have anonymous access basically to any RSS feed I want. So here's 
Grasshopper, and I see Alex anchorly linked to Grasshopper. This is my own application. Now, before you ask, it's not a commercial application. It is open source. The code is available, and uh, Docker uh, Docker containers are available so that you can run this on your own. But this isn't a product. This is my research lab. So. Um, and it's important to understand that because, uh, you know, it's if you use it, it has bugs and it has bugs because I'm constantly tweaking the code to try this, that and the other thing. And, and even with this course, uh, as you'll see, if you look at my videos, every once in a while I stop and say, well, I got to stop here, go make some changes to the grasshopper code. And then we'll come back and I'll continue. Uh, and that's what I've been doing for a number of years. So in Grasshopper, um, I have different types of data. One of the types of data is, of course, module. Here are the modules in the ethics course. And so I make each of these modules available as a separate page or as a separate piece of data. Um, these modules in turn are linked to other course components. They might be linked to individual posts. They might be linked to, uh, well, they're linked to the course as a whole. They're linked to uh, things like presentations. And as I, as I talk about these modules and course structures, I want you to think about what do we mean by an open education resource? Because here, I consider each one of these modules to be an open educational resource. Each one of them has a specific location on the web. Each one of them has content and each one of them has links to other resources. So you could access the ethical practices and learning analytics module, but you're, you're going to get some content, but you're also going to get some links to other resources. And that's an essential part of thinking of that module as an open educational resource. I know that's not the model of OERs that we have, where each of them is a standalone thing and you assemble them like bricks. This is different. This is a different way of thinking about it. And that's how I build the courses in Grasshopper. Uh, these are three different ways of looking at the assembly or the linking of course components. Each of these, each box represents a different standalone type of thing. An institution, for example, is a separate object. An author is a separate object. Each of the modules is a separate object. The modules link up to things like activities, which are live events resources, which might be media or whatever, tasks, etc. cetera. Um, they link back to things that might be skills, or I could take you back into competency definitions, etc. cetera. You can see how I'm building here, not like, not like a textbook, but these interrelated connections of modules. And you might think, well, why does this have anything to do with not needing registration. Well, I make this entire structure available to students so that they can access any or all of it without any barriers. So um, the other thing I do is to support syndication. So this is, this is one of the major requirements for registration. I should have put that back on that second slide. One of the reasons why people require registration. And the reason is, if you want to add any content to the course, well, you have to log in with your user ID and password and be approved before you, you know, before you can put content on the course website. And that's a, you know, that's a legitimate concern. Because as we've learned, if you don't do that, you're going to get a pile of spam. Um, Speaking of UNESCO definition, says Alex Enkerly, it does sound like course structure could qualify as OER. It's not just about granularity. Absolutely. Um, 
So I don't think I should set up a course like a discussion board or like a social media site where everyone comes to me and puts content on my website, which I will then lock down and make disappear at the end of the course. That just seems to be wrong. So the way my MOOCs are set up, the way they've always been set up, you use your own website or your own application to create content. If you want, you can share that content with us. It's not required by any means. Um, but if you want, you can share that content with us. Just tell us where it is so that we can go and get it. So, and that's what this supports. I, I do syndication through a two-step process. First of all, I ask people to provide their, uh, whoops, dang. Uh, I'm trying to click on something here uh, on a forum. Of course, it's not a forum, it's a slide. Uh, provide your RSS feed Adam or JSON feed link so that we know where your content is. And then the course harvests it and presents or, or stores a list of feeds. And then the contents of these, you know, these are all blogs provided by individuals. They use a course tag, in this case, hashtag ethics21, which believe it or not, when I searched on Twitter, was not being used by anyone. So <laughs> bonus. Um, so people just do their, uh, they write their blog post, they use the tag ethics21, my harvester harvests it, brings their content into the course, or more accurately, brings a link to their content into the course and makes that link available to everyone else. Of course, you shouldn't have to depend on the course for that list of links. So you can download the list of feeds in a format called OPML, load them into your own RSS reader, and now you're reading everybody else's contributions to the course without ever accessing the course. And that's a no registration mechanism. Similarly, the course newsletter takes all of these different course elements, um, modules, presentations, videos, the links that are provided by people that have been harvested, puts them all together. Here is a HTML version of the newsletter, but also I provide an RSS version of the newsletter and even a JSON version, but nobody uses the JSON version, just too early for that. So that people can access this again with zero registration. Activities and events I've integrated with calendar options. I've tried to keep activities and events as non-connected to the course as possible. So the course provides access to these, but we use things like Zoom or whatever. But I've set up a mechanism so that you can go to what I call the activity center. That's the uh, thing in the middle and watch the activity and even participate in the activity through comments without actually registering anything at all. And the list of activities can be harvested and put into your own calendar, uh, either one by one or uh, as a whole set. And I use a thing called the calendar ICS format for that. Um, similarly, adding and sharing media. This is what I call a presentation page. And honestly, I don't know why every conference and every, every uh, individual making presentations doesn't provide this. Thank you, Lisa. Um, on the left-hand side, this is my, these are my slides. I was using SlideShare, but then it was sold and now they throw up a great big barrier asking you to subscribe to other things that they offer. I was using Microsoft, but for various reasons, that was horrible. Now I simply use a plugin offered by Mozilla that allows me to put in my presentation as a PDF. This is a video embedded in YouTube, not ideal, but I'm still working on that. Activities in the, oops, wrong way. Um, 
mechanisms to upload and share media to support this presentation page. So I'm making these original format documents widely available so that you don't have to subscribe to get at them. Podcasts and transcripts, same sort of thing. I, I record audio of all of these presentations. I record the transcript. This is the Google recorder that records the transcript. Again, making these accessible without login so that you have a variety of ways of accessing the course. Flow even. Uh, I could talk for a whole hour about how I change the flow so that you can choose how you go through the course rather than having it prescribed for you. Publishing, this is the way to break the sign-in barrier. Uh, the MOOC is just the place where I work on the course and, and create and organize the content, but then I send it out to the world. And ideally, in the long run, it eventually lands in your personal learning environment. And then for importing, imagine this flow reversed where you can contribute to the course through any of these mechanisms and by that way, add your content to the course content. Next phase, and this is what I'm experimenting with this course, is to actually take the content types and making them elements in the same way. So for example, we have a module called Applications of Analytics. So an application is a data type. Each application becomes an individual piece of data with its own address, with its own free and open access, with its own uh, participation in this network of linked data. And the entire structure of the course contents can be organized into JSON, distributed, and ultimately, once people have these things, imported into their own PLE. The, that's what I'm trying to build with Grasshopper. It's not all there yet, but that's the vision that I'm working toward. So that's the talk, the presentation, and I do still have some time for questions and I'd be happy to take them. I know it felt a bit rushed, but I actually finished with two minutes left in my time. So comments, questions, I'd love to hear them. And the audience has been stunned into silence. Either that or they're fleeing. They're fleeing. <laughs> well, okay. Thanks, everyone. I hope you found this interesting. Uh, you can still join the course. Um, am I affiliated with the UNESCO Open Education Project? I'm not, no. Um, but I'm certainly supportive of it. Thanks everyone, it's been a pleasure having you here. And I'll stay on after the session and session recording ends in case anyone wants to talk a little bit more formally or chat in the chat.